Are you preparing to crush part three of optometry boards? Then this video is for you. What's up guys, it's Dr. Andreas here, and this video we'll be talking about everything you need to know to get ready for part three of boards. We all know that this test is more of a performance and it is actually testing your knowledge, so it can be stressful in different ways than you may be used to, especially if you tend to get stage fright. And since this trip involves flying to Charlotte, booking a hotel or Airbnb on top of the registration fees, that can put a lot of pressure on you, especially if it's not your first time. Luckily, in this video, I'll walk you through everything you need to know to set you up for success, even if something goes wrong. And if you like the video, please smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content. One disclaimer before I start, I took part three on January of 2019 and got around a 91%, which at the time was a score of 624. I'm licensed to practice in Florida, and this video is a combination of my study habits, my experience while taking boards, and the experience of some of my peers. Here is the outline of the video. You'll probably be registering for the exam and lodging before you even start studying for part three. So I'll be talking about this first. Then I'll discuss your script, then general tips of, on the stations, and lastly, some important troubleshooting tips before and after your performance, but before your time is up. Step one, choosing the day of your exam and lodging. So as far as when to take your exam, I would try to avoid November as that is just a month away from taking part two. Same thing for March, try to avoid it then if you're retaking part one. If you've already scheduled a date but want to change it, you should have the option to reschedule at no charge up to around six times. I took mine in January, which was actually pretty good timing as I was done from part two. I was already two months into my disease externships at the Columbia VA, so I had a lot of practice doing dilated exams, and at the time I was home for winter break, so I had free time to practice things like case history. I wasn't close to clinic, so that was a downside, but I had to practice the clinical stuff in advance before I went home. So just keep in mind the date you pick, but it should be fine as long as you plan accordingly. For instance, maybe don't book doing your PEDS rotation if you know you're going to be very busy with PEDS evaluations, visual therapy sessions, and presentations. Maybe instead book doing your primary care rotation, for example, if you know you're only seeing two patients a day and are going to have a lot of downtime. Some people booked early in the fall, which may be fine, but just make sure you've had enough practice with BIO and 90, as well as the other skills. Also, I wouldn't pick a date later than February as you want to account for the unfortunate possibility of having to retake part three. More on that later. Lodging. This decision may be more important than you realize. I would avoid staying right where the testing center is simply due to the noise from traffic. I had heard from a few classmates that they couldn't sleep from the noise and you definitely want to get some good sleep before your two plus hour performance, even more if you're planning on doing injections or a law exam. Also, I would imagine that the hotels there are very pricey. Personally, I stayed in an Airbnb that was a 10 minute Uber from the testing center. I slept like a baby and I only paid like 30 bucks a night. I even recommended this option to a classmate who was very skeptical of Airbnb at first and she had an amazing experience as well. And if you're still one of those people who doesn't want to do Airbnb, I'd reconsider it. They can be much cheaper and frankly can provide better customer service and amenities at times. I've stayed in more than 10 Airbnbs and often I prefer those over hotels. This is especially true if you happen to be taking the test on the same day as multiple classmates. So just book a house and split the fee. Step two, deciding on a script. Your script is essentially what you're using to practice with. It pretty much tells you everything you plan to say on each station. From, I will be giving a 10 minute prescription, to, I will now be checking your eye pressure. The key is to practice saying what you're gonna say so many times that by the time you're actually taking your exam, you're on autopilot, so you're much less likely to mess up. The only problem is NBO doesn't have an official script, so you're left with making one on your own or using a script from a classmate, upper classmate, or someone from another optometry school, which is fine. However, always, always, always consult with the evaluation form for each station that is provided on the NBEO website. That is the most accurate, most up-to-date source and gives you the most insight to what procedures, actions you have to take to earn points. Forms can be found in the link below. I say this because a lot of students just rely on a script that someone else made. While that may be helpful and give you some guidance, all that matters is what you say matches with what the NBO evaluation form outlines. This makes sense as the evaluation form is not strict on what exactly you need to say. For example, station two evaluation form at some point asks you to 
accurately describe the temporal interior chamber angle findings using the Van Herrick technique. So if you see a 4 plus Van Herrick, what should you say? Here are two examples that I took from two different scripts. Example one, the temporal interior chamber angle using the Van Herrick technique is 4 plus. The angle is wide open and safe to dilate. And the second example is width of dark space of anterior chamber is equal to or greater than corneal thickness. The temporal angle is open 4 plus using Van Herrick angle estimation. So who is correct? Example 1 or example 2? The answer is both, as they both accurately describe the angle. With that said, I think it's much easier for me to practice saying the first answer as part of my script. My point being, don't just rely on someone else's script, either modify it in the simplest way to help you, or just make your own. Personally, I spent most of my time practicing with evaluation forms in my hand. I verbally made my own script as I pretty much just follow the directions of NBEO in ways that I thought were simplest for me to remember. Now, if you're still set on about using someone else's script because you want more guidance on exactly what to say, that is okay, but at least compare the script side by side with the evaluation form. Is the script following the NBEO guidelines? Am I hitting every bullet point with the script? This is especially true as the NBO exam changes every single year, right? One of the scripts I got from a classmate said that I should disinfect the tonometer tip when I begin station two. Of course, that is wrong as NBO no longer requires you to do so. Anyways, if you're still lost, I'm currently working on making a script that matches the 2020 NBO evaluation forms, which I will link below as well. Step three, general tips for each station. Station one. While the exam items in each station may change as time goes on and the NBO people switch things around, chances are station one is probably going to be case history. This is actually one of the stations that you want to devote the most of your practice time as it is the most dependent on what you may actually say. This is also the station that is the easiest to practice as you don't even have to be a clinic. You can practice with a colleague at home, at school, in clinic, or anywhere. And your companion doesn't even have to be an optometry student. I used to go to Starbucks with my cousin, who was just a college student at the time, and she used to pretend to be my patient as she would just present with random complaints from a long list of symptoms that I gave her. Speaking of lists, for the patient education skill, you should definitely have a comprehensive list of conditions like dry eyes, cataract, glaucoma, even less routine ones like keratoconus, retinitis pigmentosa, etc. Have that list written on a sheet of paper to make things easier. For each condition, make sure you have the following things as listed in the 2020 evaluation form. Description of the condition and how it affects the eyes, two facts and details. Preventative, diagnostic, and or treatment options, three facts and details. Prognosis, interval and or follow-up, two facts, details. This way, even if your friend has no background in optometry, they have this list and they can pick any condition for you and have you fully describe it on the spot, making sure you hit all the above facts, details in a precise period of time. Another tip, make sure you familiarize yourself with a patient data form just so you know where everything is. You get to look at the sheet while you talk to your patient, so it is a good way to make sure you're not forgetting any questions, like let's say family history. Keep in mind though that hobbies and occupation are two things that are not listed on the 2020 patient data form, so don't be like me and forget to ask about those things. While you're at it, take a quick look at the age and sex of the patient. Even though my patient was a middle-aged female in real life, the form actually said that my patient was a young male. This led to a very embarrassing exchange where I said, good morning, Miss Lee. And she's like, it's actually Mr. Lee. And I was like, ooh, sorry. <laughs> and station one was my first station, so that was a bad way to start my part three exam. But luckily, I was able to move on smoothly after apologizing. Therefore, if you mess up for any reason, don't stress out about, about it too much, as it is bound to happen to almost everyone taking this test, which is good considering a lot of us pass this test. Now, even though you're not in clinic while practicing for station one, make sure you time yourself on case history and patient education as those will take the bulk of your time. For example, I wanted to practice enough so I could finish those two skills in eight to 10 minutes. That way I can breeze through all the other skills in the remaining 20 to 22 minutes of station one. As for the remaining skills, they're pretty straightforward. So as long as you practice them and occasionally time yourself, you should be good. One comment I'll make is that for measuring vertical prism, it doesn't really matter which lens you examine first, as four prism adapters based down in the right eye are the same as four prism adapters based up in the left eye. I say this because this is one of your last skills, so if you're running low on time, just put the glasses in the lensometer with whatever lens is the reference, center it, then switch to the other lens and measure the prism that way. Simple as that. Station two. 
This is the other station that requires a lot of practice just because it is the most time sensitive. So when I took it, there was slint lamp, tonometry, gonioscopy, collagen plugs, and a soft and RGB contacts. Because of this, I would advise when you practice timing yourself, give yourself the most scrutiny. Maybe try to get everything done in 25 to 26 minutes instead of 30, which sounds scary, but if you come into station two with the expectation of, hey, I gotta knock these out quick, and you practice, 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 then you will be ready. And if you can get them done in 26 minutes, then if something goes wrong, you're still able to finish up that big section before in under three minutes. Now, it doesn't matter what order you scan each area of the eye, as long as you examine all areas as listed on the evaluation form. So if it's easier for you to do upper lids and lashes, upper bulbar, then nasal temporal conge, then lower conge, lower lids and lashes, then invert the lid and do everything else, then you can certainly do that. If on the other hand, you prefer doing upper lids and lashes, evert, lower lids and lashes, then all four bulbar conge co quadrants, then the rest of the exam, then do that. Whatever seems smoother and easier for you to remember, especially if you have a specific order that you have been doing this on all your patients in clinic. That way it's more natural for you and again, you're less likely to mess up. Another thing to consider is not all items are weighted equally. So if you mess up on the collagen plugs or you don't place it as smoothly as you have practiced it in the past, don't worry about it. It's not a significant portion of your grade. Just perform and move on. On the other hand, make sure you knock slit lamp out of the park because that is a large chunk of station two. Lastly, remember to ask, do you have a view like two to three times throughout the station to ensure that the proctor is seeing what you're seeing. If they don't have a view or if they lose a view, they don't have to tell you unless you ask them, which kind of sucks, but I would rather lose a few seconds by repeatedly asking if they can still see my view to make sure that I get credit for what I'm doing. Station three. Honestly, there isn't much to say on the station. If you follow the NBEO guidelines, this will probably be your fastest station. Most people end up finishing with like 10 to 15 minutes to spare, so timing isn't an issue. Because of that, make sure you take your time doing your retinoscopy and refraction, as well as all the other skills, so that you have good measurements. If you look at the evaluation form, it doesn't explicitly say how you refract, how much you fog the patient, which line to put up, all that stuff. Just refract like you normally do in clinic and get a good prescription. Plus, if the patient reads 2020 after your retinoscopy, that's only going to give you a confidence boost. If not, assume that the subjective refraction is going to be different anyways and just do your thing. Don't worry about it. Station 4. This is an important section, but not as time sensitive as Station 2. Chances are, if you're on your external rotations, you probably don't need to practice this, this section quite as much. Personally, I was at the VA hospital doing 10 dilated exams a day with 90D and BIO for like 6 weeks before I took my exam. So I only practiced this section like maybe three to five times. With that said, make sure you do time yourself for this section at least once at some point because the more practice, the more automatic this will uh, feel when taking the test, which means a smaller chance that your nerves get in the way. For the BIO section, I would advise you to practice getting to each of the eight views and holding for five seconds. This way, there's a higher chance that the camera will pick it up. This is another reason to practice this section as when you're seeing patients, you're typically not looking at his view for the entire five seconds. Very important note, the BIO available during part three has two plus lenses in there. You need to make sure that you're capable of performing the skill with a plus two lenses. This requires relaxing your accommodation and holding your 20D lens in a different position than you normally would. And this also may affect the size of the light on your BIO. Alternatively, if you have convergence deficiency like I did and cannot use a plus two adapter lenses on your BIO, just buy a minus two adapter pair of glasses and wear them solely for BIO use. That's what I did right here. These are a cheap $20 pair. And honestly, I feel like I would have failed the BIO skill if I didn't have those glasses. I can't stand the plus two adapter lenses on the BIO. And as a matter of fact, I used my BIO glasses during my whole residency as the BIOs at the VA had the plus two adapters inserted. Either way, just make sure you're able to use the BIO that's provided for the NBO exam. BIO lighting. You cannot adjust the lighting yourself, but if you think the lighting is too dim, definitely tell the proctor and they can make some adjustments for you. This can help you out, especially if your patient has dark colored eyes, which means their fundus is going to be dark and you're going to need as much lighting as you can get. 90D fundus exam. I can't stress this enough. Make sure the proctor has a view. This is the number one advice I give to everyone that asks me for part three tips 
because I had a very stressful experience in this section and frankly was the only really stressful part of my entire part three experience as I needed to pass 90D in particular to get a Florida license. I asked my proctor if she had a view and she said yes. Then after scanning one of the retinal quadrants, I asked again if she had a view and she said no, which made no sense to me as I was looking through the left ocular only with my right eye closed just to be sure and I was also very confident in my 90 doctor abilities. I made a few adjustments and then I would repeatedly ask her if she had a view and she would sometimes say yes, sometimes say no. And I ended up having to do all the quadrants multiple times just to make sure that the proctor saw what I saw. We'll get to what I did about this later. Don't forget at the end of 90D, there's a patient education section similar to station one where the proctor will give you a finding like lattice, PVD, RD, flame hemorrhage, and you'll want to, according to the 2020 Station 4 evaluation form, give one descriptive fact and the findings associated management strategy. This is a section that you can practice at Starbucks as well. Step four, troubleshooting tips before and after your performance. So one thing you might have already heard from other people before you take part three is that the NBO takes you to a room that has almost all the equipment in the whole exam. There is our slit lamp, blood pressure cuff, PD stick, all that stuff. I think the only things that were missing were like collagen plugs and BIO. But anyways, they leave you in that room for like 20 minutes or so, so take advantage of it. Practice using all the equipment, how to focus the new slit lamp, change the mags, how to use a blood pressure cuff and other things, just so you can become more familiar with the equipment and not waste precious time when the clock actually starts ticking. After the test. If you have any remote thought that something went wrong or was unfair on your end during the exam, please, please file a complaint on the computer. That is exactly what those last 15 minutes are for. In my case, I mentioned my issue with a proctor not seeing my 90D views. After I filed my complaint, a proctor came up to me and said that they, they always review every complaint and told me that because I scanned the quadrants numerous times, luckily they had enough footage on, of my 90D evaluation. They didn't know why there was an issue with the camera, and honestly, it could have just been a fluke event, but this made me immediately feel so much better instead of me going home worrying about my issue for weeks until my score finally came out. Now, I doubt that me complaining affected my score at all, as they literally said everything looked good, but I got the reassurance that they reviewed the footage upon my request. In fact, one of my classmates made a similar complaint after his test when he thought there was an issue with his BIO, and after reviewing the footage and understanding the problem, they let him repeat that skill again at that time. He proceeded to ace that section. I had another classmate who had an issue with station 3 because her patient wasn't responding appropriately to her questions or didn't just answer right, so her refraction wasn't very accurate, but she didn't complain about it on the computer. So for the next few weeks, she was stressed out that station three may have caused her to fail. She was totally fine, by the way. Long story short, if you think there was a valid issue, always complain about it. <laughs> Go full Karen if you have to, because I would rather do that and pass than have to spend $1,000 or more to fly to Charlotte again just to retake that test. Anyways, I hope that advice helped. Feel free to comment below with any f further questions or any future topics you want to see. I'll be making a follow-up video addressing if you didn't pass on the first try, which is not the end of the world, but if you follow this advice and practice, 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 you'll be good to go in no time. Again, if you liked the video, please smash that like in and subscribe to the channel for more content. Take care, everyone.